You've seen how a simple cell, such as a Daniel cell, has a metal, zinc or copper, say, in contact with its ions, and that's the basis of each half cell. We can actually make a half cell from any combination of a more oxidised and a more reduced species in solution. Look at the diagram on the right here, which is figure 16.7. We've got Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus. One's more oxidised and one's more reduced, and they can accept or release electrons and so behave as a half cell. The only snag is that we've got to find a way of collecting those electrons. So what you have is a piece of platinum foil, which is in contact with the Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus ions in solution. And it acts as a conductor for the electrons, which then can then flow along a wire. If you now look at the left-hand diagram, which is figure 16.8, you'll see a similar setup for hydrogen ions and hydrogen gas. The tricky thing here is that we have hydrogen gas, and of course that needs to be brought into contact with the H plus ions and the platinum. So we use this glass bubbler to pass the hydrogen gas over the platinum foil. And the platinum foil is dipping into a solution of aqueous hydrogen ions, usually a solution of hydrochloric acid. We could connect these two half cells together using a wire, and we could include a high resistance voltmeter if we wanted to measure the potential of the cell. Of course, we'd also need a salt bridge. And now we have a cell. And this particular cell could be used to measure the standard electrode potential of the Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus half cell. Because the standard hydrogen half cell has been chosen as the reference point for measuring the potential of all other half cells. There's more about this on page 736.